Not all heroes are found on the battlefield. Some are found in the halls of Congress. This is the story of one such hero, a moderate Republican from Illinois who spoke out against segregation, the Vietnam War, and against powerful lobbyists. His recommendations were the centerpiece for a nuclear non-proliferation treaty between Brazil and Argentina. He was the first to call for diplomatic relations with Red China and to call for the establishment of a Palestinian state alongside Israel. For 22 years, this country congressman had the courage to fight and battle for causes he believed in. This is the story of Paul Findlay, who had the courage to speak out. I view Paul as one of the finest men I ever knew in politics, and therefore uh, not necessarily a good politician, because to be politic is not to offend, and Paul didn't care. He said what he thought. He was a great leader of our party in the Congress, uh, sometimes lonely in the sense uh, issues. He certainly paid the political price. I don't think he'd change a thing if he had to do over again. When I took the oath of office, I reflected on the fact that I was one of 537 people elected as governors of the United States of America. So I decided to make the most of the very first term I had, and I dug into agriculture in a big way. Uh, the Kennedy administration had big plans for a farm bill. Well, I opposed the bill very strongly because it would have given the government a lot of control over feed grains, planting, and marketing. My motion to recommit the bill prevailed by 10 votes. Paul Finley was born in Jacksonville, Illinois, on June 23, 1921, one of five children of Joseph and Florence Finley. The Presbyterian Church did not have a minister, and so they asked my father, who was the YMCA director, if he would fill the pulpit, and so he did. There was a black church that did not have a pastor for quite a while. And he went to that church and did sermons and was their, their minister for a while. And um, I heard of this later, that they had said to him that when he was through that they, they felt like he was one of them. And I thought that was the best thing anybody could say. My parents were Republicans, so I inherited my interest in the Republican Party and often criticized uh, President Roosevelt and would express my criticism on a sheet of paper that I would mimeograph, pass them out to anybody who would, would take them. This was my beginning of speaking out. Paul's courage to stand alone came as a young high school student. I remember hearing about the fact that uh, they had minstrel shows, and uh, if you don't know about a minstrel show, they always had what they called end men, and they were white boys who had put black on their faces and big red mouths, and they would make um, jokes that demeaned the black people, really. It was a kind of a yes boss thing, and um, Paul put something in the paper objecting to the minstrel shows. So I sounded off in a letter to the editor of the Jacksonville Herald. It was published and it had quite a reaction. So I had a number of reasons to speak out. I did it and I knew that I would be criticized for it, and I was certainly, but I thought it was worthwhile to make the stand. Remember one day my mother gave me, oh, 50 cents, I think, to come down to the store to buy something. And I didn't hear her say, you can spend the rest for candy, whatever's left. So I came back home and gave her the change. And she mentioned that I could have stayed and bought some candy. I said, well, I'll go back and buy it. And she said, no, you stay home now. <laughs> Isn't it funny why it's something like that stick in your mind? She worked for 
not just her family of seven, five children, but for um, a great number of young people that she influenced through through Sunday school, she's always a Sunday school teacher, through her job as manager of the high school cafeteria. She saw to it that, that poor people that couldn't even afford the 15 cents for lunch had a way to earn that, that lunch. Those were days in which self-reliance was still a big part of American life. But it was a period in which um, most people felt if they had problems, they had to solve them themselves, and they found a way to do it. And there was a spirit uh, of that that um, I found inspiring. I'm sure it helped to mold my uh, conservative attitude toward the role of government, an attitude that I've modified quite a bit in later years. Paul enlisted as a Navy cadet to a CB construction battalion for the liberation of Guam. He met a beautiful flight nurse, Lucille Jim. They became close friends and after the war were married. After the liberation of Guam, they were being refitted for the trip to Japan. Then suddenly the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Japanese surrender. Now, we went ashore anyway, and shortly after we landed, one of my buddies and I borrowed a jeep and drove to Nagasaki. And I saw the enormous destructive power of one bomb. And I made a vow I would do the best I could in my life to try to figure out a way that the people of the world could work together and have a rule of law instead of a rule of force. Perhaps looking back, it was a childish dream, but I was motivated by the fact that so many people on both sides had given their lives in this conflict. This war had to produce something better. It had to lead to a better world. That's what I, what I thought and what I planned for my life. After the war, Paul became editor of the Pike County Republican, a newspaper in Pittsfield, Illinois. The couple had two children, Craig and Diane. In 1960, Paul launched his political career in Congress. The veteran congressman of the district, Sid Simpson of Carrollton, suddenly died, made up my mind instantly to try to succeed him. Campaigning was fun then. Uh, they, the campaigns weren't bitter. People were enthusiastic. They, they saw a bright future. And, and remember that uh, the year my dad ran for Congress was the year Kennedy ran for the White House. So there was a, a lot of feeling that, uh, that there was a young group of people back from World War II who were going to change things, uh, bring peace and prosperity. Uh, Kennedy generated enormous enthusiasm for politics. And although Dad ran as a Republican, I think he benefited some from the enthusiasm that, that came at that uh, particular period in history. That young boy who spoke out against a minstrel show would in his first year in Congress introduce legislation to stop federal funding of segregated public parks. I offered the amendment in uh, the House Ag Committee, which just, just happened to be considering a bill that would authorize the construction of, of some um, facilities for recreation in rural areas and uh, it was shouted down. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination and put an end to complicated literacy tests and other hampering tactics. I think the strongest opposition that he ever had in the district was uh, when he supported the civil rights bill of uh, 66 and uh, his proposal that Dr. Martin Luther King should be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. 
Now that created a firestorm. It's not popular. I I never hesitated. I was convinced that this was wrong, that this segregation was wrong, that whenever I had a chance to move it in the right direction, I would, even though I might fail. My party owed a lot to Abraham Lincoln's example. And for that reason, I had the temerity to write a letter to all of the Republican members of the House, urging them, in effect, to defy their leader, Gerald Ford, and vote for the bill. The Voting Rights Act, the, the Civil Rights Act, were all passed in that period of time. Um, and as I understand it, Paul Finley approached Gerald Ford about making this appointment and making it happen for, for a kid from Springfield because that was Abraham Lincoln's district. At the time, Mr. Finley represented, you know, that area, so it, it, it all made sense. From the pages or from the members of Congress, there was never any, any hint of me not feeling welcome. And I attribute that to Paul Finley and Gerald Ford. On the other hand, I didn't do anything special. I was not a civil rights pioneer. I didn't feel like I, I didn't feel like I broke down any barriers. What I thought I did was went and did a good job and represented myself, my race, my city, rep represented all that well, so that then the next person who came along, there wouldn't be any hesitation as to whether a Negro can handle this, you know, because I had handled it. By 1969, public opinion hadn't shifted, but things like Paul did courageous things to, which ran against the Republican Party in those days. Nixon had been elected in 68 with a plan to end the war, which turned out to be a plan really to quadruple the bombing and win the war. But uh, Paul had a lot of guts. Later, when they uh, announced the winner of the Vietnam War Memorial, Mr. Finley was, I think, out of Congress then. I was in Oklahoma, and I read in the paper that they were going to put the names of the war dead on these um, black slabs of marble. And I knew, although no one ever said, I knew that Paul Finley was the inspiration for that. In 1965, Congressman Finley had been on the House Agriculture Committee, and he had obtained the names of every American who received over $5,000 a year in agricultural subsidies. And he inserted those names in the congressional record. Well, we were talking one day at lunch about how to dramatize the loss in Vietnam. And I said, you put the names of everybody that uh, through agricultural subsidies. I said, surely there's a list of people that have been killed in Vietnam somewhere. And I said, why don't we ask for that list? And he said, uh, well, that's a good idea. Draft a letter and I'll, I'll sign it. So I went back to the office and drafted a letter to the Secretary of Defense asking for the names of every American serviceman or servicewoman that had been killed in the Vietnam conflict. Well, uh, several weeks passed, and frankly, I forgot it. Uh, and then one day, uh, the receptionist came in and said, uh, Mr. Jones, there's a package here that needs to be signed for the Congress. And it took me a minute to realize what they were. And then I realized what it was, that it was the names on computer of, I believe it was 28 or 29,000 American servicemen and women that had been killed in Vietnam. So Mr. Finley sort of took the ball from then. He said, I'm going to insert this in the congressional record. So he uh, typed, he got his old typewriter there, and he typed down Vietnam Roll of Honor. And uh, there was a short introductory paragraph. And then the next day, he went over to the House floor, and under the unanimous consent, routinely at the beginning of the day, congressmen can insert matters in the congressional record. Well, nobody really knew what he was inserting. They didn't know the size of it. So then he had it delivered to the clerk's office. Well, the next morning, uh, Washington, or at least 
political Washington and governmental Washington and the media live by the congressional record. And they're used to getting it every morning. Well, the next morning, the congressional record didn't appear. And people started asking, well, where's the record? What's, what's the delay? And um, finally, about noon, somebody called the <clears throat> government printing office, and they said, well, uh, we've had four linotype operators up all night. Uh, it's uh, Paul Finley's list of the war dead. Well, it was a dramatic way of showing the human cost, and that was just the American human cost. Well, soon families of people who had died in Vietnam began to write, and they wanted a copy of the record. And then it was used as an anti-war protest movement. People would walk across the stage carrying these names. Then when Mr. Nixon took office, uh, about six months after, he put in the ones that had died since Richard Nixon became president. Well, you can imagine how that went over at the White House. I got to be a page at the uh, Republican National Convention in 1972 in Miami. But uh, that was a funny time. We were uh, supporting Rockefeller, and uh, I believe Jane Fonda was outside burning buses on the other side of the chain link fence, and I'm in the convention hall thinking, I wonder if I'm on the right side here. From the beginning of the Vietnam War, I began to challenge President Johnson as to whether he acted within constitutional restraints in magnifying the size of our combat operations in Vietnam. The Congress in 1964 passed what they called the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. It authorized the president to respond to an attack that supposedly occurred against U.S. sea craft in the Vietnam region. It actually did not occur at all. And whenever anyone would challenge him about the uh, use of military force that he employed in Vietnam, he would pull that resolution out in trying to rescind the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And we finally got it rescinded in 1970. And in 1971, in January, it became effective. I think January 10th, 71. And shortly thereafter, Nixon invaded Cambodia. We rescind the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. And two weeks later, the president invades a wholly new country, Cambodia. Nixon's expansion of the war triggered a constitutional battle between Congress and the president. Paul would be at the center of that fight. The first evolution, I think, in his thinking was his belief that the House of Representatives had essentially abandoned its role in foreign affairs and foreign policy. And he worked to reassert that. And so that starts it, and then it ends up with the War Powers Act effectively uh, limiting what the President of the United States could do unilaterally in terms of military force abroad. But first, it was a reassertion of the House's authority. I think this was instead an assertion on the part of Congress of its own constitutional role in the field of war powers, a role that we've very uh, seriously neglected in recent years. I took part in a, a very important effort in the House Foreign Affairs Committee, on which I then served, trying to construct a resolution that would clarify the right of the president to use acts of war abroad. Because Lyndon Johnson dealt with the use of war powers in what some people felt was a murky area of law, we decided to, to enact a war powers resolution, which spelled out the circumstances in which the president has the right to use military force and the circumstances in which he doesn't. I wasn't the chief author. Uh, Jacob Javits of New York, a senator, and I probably could share that claim, uh, but I did contribute language to the act, and I urged its passage. And when President Nixon felt it was an intrusion on the executive power uh, vetoed the act. Uh, I helped to override his veto. 
and make it long. He was a gentleman, is a gentleman, a Christian, conscientious about uh, doing the right thing and never having a thought about doing the wrong thing. He had a, an appointment for a meeting in Quincy on one occasion and that his car failed. I said, Paul, just take my car and go over to Quincy. At that time, I had a Lincoln Continental and he said, Chet, I wouldn't dare drive a over there and appear in a Lincoln Continental. <laughs> My constituency would appreciate me more if I was driving a Chevrolet or a Ford or a Plymouth. Paul was always considerate of the people who we represented. My dad was always very careful to um, make sure that there were things of interest for me. During my early college days, we went to um, Cairo and uh, Israel, met Moshe Diane. He was like, he was like a movie star. He was a magnetic kind of guy. But he, he had big, gnarly hands, and he shook my hand with his big, gnarly hand, and he goes, ah, we have the same name. Diane. I think the highest tribute that Mr. Finley ever received was the Washington Post uh, one Sunday in an op-ed piece on the op-ed page was this article called Representative in Congress. And all it was was Mr. Finley's weekend schedule in the district that weekend. From early morning to late at night, Mr. Finley was everywhere. Listening, meeting, he was what people should expect in a congressman. Lincoln had a grip on me as a child, and he never let up. I got a tattered copy of The Prairie Years by Sandberg. I devoured the, every page of it, and he became a really a vital inspiration to me. And one of the great joys I had as a member of Congress was success in making the Lincoln home and the neighborhood around a part of the National Park Service. It's the only national park in the state of Illinois. The restoration of the Lincoln home has been a, a great joy that I've followed closely. In 1967, China funneled arms to North Vietnam. Communist China was a sworn enemy of the United States. It couldn't have been a worse time to call for diplomatic relations with Red China. Paul did just that. Mr. Finley was the first Republican member of the House of Representatives to call for the establishment of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. He did that in 1967. Um, he wrote Mr. Nixon a memo after he'd been elected president on the United States should change its policies in China. And little did we know that that was coming. Driving into Quincy, Illinois one day in 1968 in a car with a big long nine-foot sign on top that said, you're a congressman, Paul Findlay, and stopping at a stoplight, and a man came over and beat on the hood and said, he's a commie, he's a commie lover, we ought to run him out of office. Kind of a surprise. Slowly but surely, people began to swing. At the same time, Paul Findlay and some others took on the role of being self-appointed ambassadors and uh, he would invite Chinese guests to the 20th district and have them speak at Illinois College in Jacksonville and then took some on a horseback ride uh, in our district. To bring diplomats from around the world to little rural communities in western Illinois, uh, they had, he brought diplomats from China, from uh, the then Soviet Union, other countries to, to see what American life was really like, to see people in a very casual, friendly setting, absent politics, absent regulation, just enjoying themselves, had to be enlightening for them, as, as was our experience being around these people who were able to, to be with us in a very relaxed way. And he was always, has been always very good at taking on leadership challenges like that. 
uh, and with the soft answer turneth away wrath, he's he's uh, been responsible for a lot of progress on a lot of fronts. Not everybody agrees, but at least they're willing to tolerate, I think. Though outspoken on issues, he was never critical of others and could reach across party lines to get important legislation passed. And I'm very proud now to sign into law uh, House Bill 5383, which provides fairness and equity in protecting uh, our older citizens from discrimination in employment. Mr. President, Paul Finley of Illinois, in 1974, I introduced the first bill to outlaw mandatory retirement. There were then just three co-sponsors. It's become a very popular idea, I'm glad to say. I consider your signature on this legislation to be the most notable act to advance social justice in at least 10 years. Thank you very much. Many farmers in America were illiterate in the early years, but the educational system that land-grant colleges carried out changed that totally and quickly and with great beneficial effect. And I felt the same could happen if we got the universities in our country to take on the job worldwide. Well, Hubert Humphrey bought my idea in the Senate the vote was the most affirmative vote that foreign aid ever had in the history of the U.S. Congress. In seen firsthand the nuclear destruction of Nagasaki, Paul worked quietly behind the scenes to put a lid on the spread of nuclear weapons. In a conversation with the Vice President of Brazil in 1977, Paul learned about the competition in nuclear energy research between his country and Argentina. Seeing the potential for a nuclear arms race, Paul got busy. And I suggested that um, he consider to have a deal so that each side would feel free to inspect anything the other side was doing at a given moment without notice. The Findlay's proposal is very interesting because uh, in that moment, both Argentina and Brazil didn't have a secret nuclear weapons program. The proposal was not well accepted in, in Brazil, but the Argentine president in that moment accepted the, the, the proposal from Paul Findlay. In 1991, after a treaty signed by uh, President Fernando Collor de Mello from Brazil and President uh, uh, Menem from Argentina, and uh, that treaty sets up a system of mutual verification and inspections of the nuclear activities in the two countries. I don't know, as a historian, if the system relies on uh, Paul Findlay's recommendations, but uh, the idea that Paul Findlay proposed was uh, very important for the, for the final outcome. Paul Findlay was not active in, in nuclear non-proliferation just uh, in 1977. He was very active also in the negotiations of uh, the non-proliferation treaty in 1968. Recently, the classified uh, US records demonstrate that uh, as congressman, he proposed to the State Department to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty in 1968. And he joined the effort of the Carter administration, but also of the Ford administration before, in trying to set up stricter non-proliferation rules. So it was one of the pillars that is not so known, his effort to avoid uh, the spread of nuclear weapons. For most of his time in Congress, Paul's foreign policy initiatives focused primarily on Europe. But in 1974, a trip to the Middle East changed all that. I was among those who were outspoken in support of Israel, although I didn't make any study of it at that point. I would be hard put to 
to identify the major countries in the Middle East at that time. I, I just had no knowledge about it. My main interest was the American-European alliance area. But in 1973, I received a letter from a woman in my home county, and she lamented the fact that her son, who had been teaching in Kuwait, had been arrested in South Yemen and charged with with spying, with espionage. Well, um, we had no diplomatic mission in South Yemen. We hadn't had any since 1967. If I were to try to get him out, as I finally concluded I had to, I would go by myself. My family approved, but reluctantly. And to my surprise, they really rolled out the carpet of welcome. They couldn't have been nicer to me. And the agenda the people in South Yemen had worked up for me dealt with the Middle East bias, favoring Israel and against the legitimate interests of the Arab states. It was the first time I had grasped bias that exists and the impact that bias had had on the attitude and the actions of of people of Arab blood. And I, I got for the first time the Arab side of the equation. I saw Arabs close up as human beings and finally had an appointment the night before my scheduled return to States uh, with uh, President Rubia Ali. And I started my plea for the release of my constituent from prison. And he interrupted me and said, we've decided to place your, your constituent in your care and he can return to the States tomorrow when you leave. Ed got to come home. And uh, it was a cause of great celebration and personal satisfaction to us all, but mainly to Paul. And it was a fine example of a congressman working like hell to make sure that the right thing was done for his constituents. After returning from Yemen, the congressman read books on the Middle East. He contacted experts, including the State Department. An old friend's personal testimony about the early years of the war added further evidence to his newfound conviction that he must take a stand for Palestinian justice in the Holy Land. When I came back here in, in, uh, in uh, 1950, uh, I, had, I had come away uh, from the war with feeling that, that the, the Jewish people had just absolutely what was horrifying as to what had happened to him. And when, in, in the 1940s, uh, there, the homeland was reestablished, there, there was uh, such a, a great sense of, of joy, uh, I, I guess I would say, that, that it had come to pass that, that what terrible things had happened to them during the war were now being amended. About 1952 or thereabouts, I belonged to a, um, a literary club called the Literary Union. And one of the speakers was uh, a man by the name of George Ziegler. And he had been with the CIA uh, uh, during the war and stationed in the Middle East. And he, in his paper, talked to the Literary Union uh, probably for uh, an hour one night uh, describing the horror as to what was going on there in the way of the displacement of the, the native people, the Palestinians. It was horrifying. I had no idea. I, I really didn't. I don't think anyone there did. Um, and he talked about how it was not ever being uh, discussed in, in the press, how our coverage was just absolutely almost non-existent of the problem. And it, it was then when Paul got into the Congress and he started to voice some of these concerns, but it was most interesting to, to watch his, his courage because um, in what he said in, in trying to speak to things that were not being said, he sacrificed his career. He, he 
could have been a senator, he could have been governor, um, but he, he chose to stand up and, and say what he thought to be right. And he's still doing the same thing. He's a remarkable man. He began to speak out, issue commentaries, write letters to the president or the secretary of state or whoever. While Israel has rights that need to be recognized, uh, so do the Arabs. And yet we don't pay any attention to the interests and the well-being of Palestinian Arabs that have been dispossessed, humiliated, literally destroyed as a society by the state of Israel. Today in the Near East, a suffering people, the Palestine Arab refugees, are struggling for survival whose native land was for centuries Palestine. Then the tragedy of war descended on that holy land and made them wanderers. Today, three quarters of a million displaced human beings are dependent upon charity for their very existence. I feel like his um, stand to provide Arab Americans a, you know, a, a voice was really, really big. That's what I, uh, he was the first to speak with Yasser Arafat, open up a dialogue with the Palestinians. You have to be really brave to do that kind of thing. Well, it was during the, the uh, Sinai Agreement, the Camp David Agreement between uh, uh, Sadat, and Begin, and Carter. And I remember when they made the deal, uh, Carter invited all of us to the White House to hear the details of the deal. And uh, while he was speaking, a fellow got up, his name was Paul Finley, stood up and he said, now what about the PLO? And uh, threw everybody into a tizzy. And, uh, Carter didn't really know how to answer it, as I recall. Congressman Paul Finley of Illinois told us about his talk with Arafat. He proposed that a peacekeeping force made up of the big five of the UN Security Council uh, be placed in the new Palestinian state on the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Did you get the impression that he's ready to recognize the existence of the State of Israel, sir? Not formally, but he drew a distinction between uh, diplomatic recognition and peaceful relations. And quite clearly, he contemplated peaceful relations. He said we have to deal with reality. Israel exists. And did he give you any message to take back to Washington? Well, he did. He, um, he dictated very carefully a message to President Carter, which I haven't had a chance to deliver as yet, but uh, it's a conciliatory message. And according to Finley, Arafat has some hidden support in the U.S. Congress. I've long felt that there needs to be an independent Palestinian state, and my impression is that the PLO is the main voice of the Palestinian movement as of today. Do many of your colleagues in the Congress agree with that point of view, sir? Well, a number of them agree, but won't say so publicly. There were people that began to say, well, you know, uh, Paul's wavering on a whole bunch of things. He's, he's, he's going off the deep end on this or that. And this thing about Yasser Arafat meeting with him, the scourge of the Middle East, and so on and so forth. Neither one of us dreamed of the forces that would be unleashed by all of that. When election time came in 1980, my opponent placed ads in every Jewish newspaper describing me as the worst anti-Semite who ever served in Congress, left a indelible mark on my name nationally. Money came from outside of our area that came in such large amounts that it was hard to compete with that kind of money with the amounts that Paul would, would raise each year. The last congressional campaign was kind of a rough one. And we were on the trail and CBS News, Phil Jones, the reporter, he came in, did an interview with my dad. It was called the Million Dollar Congressman because it had, to that date, been the most money that had been spent on a congressional campaign. First thing that Phil Jones did was put the microphone in my dad's face and say, Paul Finley, how long have you been an anti-Semite? 
And it, it was just such a, a, a splash of water in the face. I was, I was surprised that, you know, grown-ups acted like that. He will spend at least $600,000. About 80% of it from outside the district, and well over half of this money is from Friends of Israel across the nation. I've been a problem to the pro-Bagan lobby. They want to dispose of me, not only to get me out of the way, but also as an example to others. Paul Findlay uh, is defeated in this particular race. It'll be a testament to the, uh, the awesome strength of the, uh, the pro-Israeli lobby in this country. Paul Finley would have remained in Congress, uh, but I don't think it was the lobby alone that defeated him. Uh, any politician is going to have opponents. But what the lobby does it, is that it comes in to uh, races, political races, uh, where someone who's been identified as anti-Israel is up for re-election or is trying to get elected for the first time. Uh, and they put their thumb on the scale, uh, and in some cases in a big way, and they can provide enough support for uh, the opposing candidate to make sure that someone like Paul Finley uh, is defeated. And the end result is that most legislators in Washington come to the conclusion that it's just not worth taking the lobby on. So this is the reason you see that so many people on Capitol Hill uh, will do basically whatever APAC asked them to do. I, I remember the 1950s when under uh, President uh, Eisenhower, uh, American policy makers had strong doubts about the wisdom of supporting Israel at the expense of the Palestinians. Um, and that's one of the reasons that uh, Abba Ibn, who was the United Nations uh, ambassador for Israel, created APAC, exactly because Eisenhower was going in a way that the Israelis didn't like. George H.W. Bush probably lost the presidency in 1992 for re-election because he was working so hard to help the Palestinians and drew the wrath of the Israeli community in September at the height of his popularity. You know, he just won this marvelous international war to depose, uh, to get the Iraqis out of Kuwait. But he made the mistake of saying that those people, and he was referring to the APAC lobby then meeting in September in Washington, D.C., those people are hurting the cause of peace. And of course, from then on, that was, I think, uh, either 90, 91 or 90, from then on, the Jewish community worked assiduously to defeat him and elect, um, who was it, Bill Clinton. Paul and I were small stuff, uh, Chuck Percy and Adlai Stevenson, a little bigger, but still small compared to the fact that they can affect every congressman uh, who dares take a position against Israel. The State Department used to be very good on Israel-Palestine in terms of the policies they would recommend, the uh, pos position papers they would write, the reports and memos they would write. I've been researching this in considerable depth. So they were recommending very uh, principled, pragmatic, rational policies that would have benefited our country enormously if we had followed them. But of course, they are overruled by Congress, who is much more interested in their next election, in getting reelected, and therefore do what the Israel lobby tells them to do. I think the district really had been subjected to four years worth of acrimony about Paul, and I think that his uh, view of being the teapot with lots of dents knocked in him, uh, uh, that was, I think, one of the things that he carried away was, gee, um, for all the work. He continued on, and, and he's continued speaking out, and uh, I, I admire him greatly for that. After his defeat in 1982, Paul wrote a book about the Israel lobby. On a Today Show telecast in June 1984, the president of the American Jewish Congress responded to Paul and his book. I think Mr. Finley innocently believes in the Palestinian cause and mistakenly believes in it. I think on the merits, he's on the wrong side of this issue, that if there's lack of balance, it's in Mr. Finley's view of the situation. On the merits, Americans believe 
that Libya is ruled by a crazy dictator, that the Syrian president uh, committed uh, uh, genocide in his own town of Hama, that Arafat and the PLO are terrorists, and that, the, and that Israel, on the contrary, is the one democratic nation in that part of the world. That's why there is that support, not because of undue influence. A few years later, Paul founded the Council for National Interest to influence policymakers on the important issues of the Middle East. The Council for the National Interest was started about 20 years ago by Paul Finley and some other former congressmen and former diplomats horrified at what was going on in the United States and interest, interested in forming an organization that would counter this very powerful Israel lobby. They started an organization that would be giving people information about the facts in the region, but also would work for policies that were in American interests and that reflected American principles of justice and fairness. From a youngster handing out leaflets to a congressman challenging presidents, Paul Findlay never let controversy or politics deter him from speaking out for the causes of justice and peace. Today, this elder statesman continues to address the important issues and events of our day, including 9-11. We deplore, as we should, the 9-11 assault that killed about 3,000 Americans, innocent people. But maybe it was a terrible form of payback by Arabs who remembered even just one episode around Beirut in 1982, when I was in the last months of my service in Congress. Israeli fighter planes and artillery massacred over 18,000 people in Beirut and neighborhood because the Palestinians were very numerous in that area. Over 18,000 were killed by bombs and artillery fire that we had condoned and furnished to the Israelis for whatever purpose they wanted to make. We are reviled so widely today when in the wake of World War II, the whole world revered America. We've lost so much because of this uh, very deep-seated bias and uh, the influence over our society by the, the lobby for the State of Israel. He's always stood up for things that he believed in. Uh, he's, often, he's, he's not always been right, uh, but he's always, always been passionate about his causes. And I think people see the sincerity in, in his beliefs and, and by and large, I think admire him for that. I certainly do. I just finished writing a book of, on my career and I dedicated it to people who seek justice only justice and that's not original deuteronomy the book of deuteronomy reports that god uh, gave a message to moses and his message was simply this seek justice only justice well moses was around a long time ago and i'm afraid uh, we've we've left the, the proper path we wandered away uh, we need to focus on justice above all because justice means the attainment of, of human rights, of dignity of everyone, of the equality of humankind in the eyes of our, the Creator, the importance of kindness, of forgiveness, of compromise for a good cause. And I think uh, the last few years that Deuteronomy passage has
motivated me more than any other thing. Although I have to admit that Abraham Lincoln is always on the outskirts of my thinking and I can't think of any initiative that I took in Congress or in my career after Congress that wasn't motivated to a great extent by the life of Lincoln. People like Paul Finley, why, well, as I say, I put one of the 10 leading Americans of my time, Paul would not survive in today's Republican Party. He would be called, a, what, a rhino, a Republican in name only. Uh, he was one of a kind. He, he, he wasn't one of a kind at the time, but there are no more people like him, Midwestern Republicans of moderation.